Today we discuss the Orthodox Church and the non-Chalcedonians, the Monophysites. The Orthodox Church and the non-Chalcedonians are not united. We have been divided since the Fourth Ecumenical Council for over a millennia and a half. In the Fourth Ecumenical Council, the non-Chalcedonians were condemned by the Orthodox Church and in subsequent councils, that condemnation was repeated. There have been attempts to reconcile, but the non-Chalcedonians refused to accept the 4th, 5th, and 6th ecumenical councils, and they refused to correct their Christology. Contrary to what the World Council of Churches, the ecumenists, would like us to believe, the union of the Orthodox with the non-Chalcedonians, the historic Coptic, Ethiopian, Eritrean, West Syrian, Syriac, Jacobite, Armenian, and Indian Malankara churches, it is not imminent. So long as the non-Chalcedonians reject the 4th, 5th, and 6th ecumenical councils and show no signs of accepting them, there will be no union. Even though there are those who say so, it is a lie to say the Orthodox and non-Chalcedonians believe the same thing. We do not believe the same thing about the nature of Christ. Non-Chalcedonians are Monophysites and do not confess the two natures of Christ. They do not accept our creed and they do not confess the same faith. They are outside of the Church and the Holy Fathers forbid intercommunion between the Orthodox and the non-Chalcedonians. The term that is used for the non-Chalcedonians by ecumenists, Eastern Orthodox, to refer to these churches, the Coptic Church, the Ethiopian Church, and so on, is meant to confuse the Orthodox. But the reality is that the Coptic Christians have been separated from the Orthodox Church since the Fourth Ecumenical Council in the 5th century. Very sadly, despite Honotikon, the condemnation of the three chapters, and the other efforts of the Fifth Council to win back the non-Chalcedonians, they were not reunited to the Byzantine Church. By the year 553, their alternative ecclesiastical hierarchy structure was already quite firmly established, a process which actually had not begun until the decade of the 530s. The non-Chalcedonians felt that the efforts of the Fifth Council were too little, too late. And the disagreement was never settled, despite further efforts on the part of the Byzantines to win back the non-Chalcedonians in the next century. To this day, the non-Chalcedonians remain separate from the Orthodox Church, the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. The body of Christ is not divided. The Church is one and only one. And the non-Chalcedonians, the Coptic Church, and so on, although they call themselves the Church, they are outside of the Church, and therefore outside of the Body of Christ. We will now look at the history and grounds for the separation. It is a difference in Christology, and it is this difference which was the reason that the non-Chalcedonians rejected the Fourth and subsequent Ecumenical Councils. Furthermore, Current dialogues between us, by ecumenists, are ignoring the Christological reasons behind the non-Chalcedonians' departure. According to Igumen Gregory in his article, The Orthodox Church and Non-Chalcedonians, it was at the Fourth Ecumenical Council, which dealt with Christology, that they, the non-Chalcedonians, separated from us Orthodox, as they held a monophysite opinion in relation to the two natures of our Lord Jesus Christ. They recognized he was from two natures, but no longer considered him to be of two natures. Recently, there have been dialogues between the non-Chalcedonians and the Orthodox, but unfortunately, says Nicholas Marinides, the dialogue has papered over the substantive problems rather than frankly tackling them. He says that given the ecclesiological presuppositions of orthodoxy, it should be troubling that the dialogue seems, at this time, 
to have assumed that the one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church has been visibly divided for 1,500 years. This seems to imply a branch theory that sees all churches as branches of one invisible church. Such a branch or invisible church theory is denied in the foundational texts outlining Orthodox participation in the ecumenical movement, such as the Toronto and Oberlin Statements. But has it slipped back in through the back door in the case of current ecumenist dialogues with the non-Chalcedonians? Also, according to Nicholas Marinides in the same article, he says, if the non-Chalcedonians are not required to accept the Fourth Ecumenical Council, Chalcedon, and the subsequent three, and to not accept the fathers whose theology played a key role in formulating the council's definitions, what does that imply regarding Orthodox theological epistemology, given that Orthodoxy believes itself to be the church of the ecumenical councils and of saints, such as Savas the Sanctified, Maximus the Confessor, and John of Damascus, who were dedicated opponents of the non-Chalcedonians of their time. In the current ecumenist discussions, dialogues, the, they argue that the saints were blinded by contemporary polemics and politics. They allege that we are now able to approach each other with greater love and understanding today because those circumstantial factors have been removed. But can we easily admit that such great saints, one of whom is Saint Maximus, composed a magnificent set of four centuries on love and exemplified its principles during his persecution by the Monothelite imperial authorities, were prevented by the zeitgeist of the late antique Roman Empire from understanding and expressing the will of God in such an important matter. Do we have the self-assurance, not to say audacity, to claim that we excel in the virtue of love more than such holy people? And even if one or another father may have sometimes erred, as has admittedly occurred in the course of church history, their concord, expressed ultimately in the dogmas of the ecumenical councils, is considered decisive and binding for Orthodox to believe. The article, Chalcedonians and Monophysites, Do We Share the Same Beliefs?, explains the origins of the Council of Chalcedon in light of the events leading up to it. Prior to the Council, the Antiochian and Alexandrian schools of thought had each emphasized an aspect of the Incarnation which was absolutely vital for our salvation. The Antiochians stressed the importance of a complete, fully functioning humanity in Christ, freely and perfectly cooperating with the Divine. The Alexandrians insisted on the necessity of a union between human and divine that was so intimate, so all-embracing, that the Word of God truly made his own the humanity which he had assumed. The fathers of the Council of Chalcedon, avoiding the heretical extremes of each position, combined the best from both schools in the Chalcedonian definition. The fathers of that council concluded as follows. Following then the Holy Fathers, we all with one voice teach that it should be confessed that our Lord Jesus Christ is one and the same Son, the same perfect in Godhead, the same perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, the same consisting of a rational soul and a body, consubstantial with the Father as to his Godhead, and the same consubstantial with us as to his manhood in all things like unto us, sin only accepted, begotten of the Father before ages as to his Godhead, and in the last days the same, for us and for our salvation, of Mary the Virgin Theotokos as to his manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, made known in two natures, which exist without confusion, without change, without division, without separation, the difference of the natures having been in no wise taken away by reason of the union, but rather the properties of each being preserved, and both concurring into one prosopon and one hypostasis, not parted or divided into two prosopa, but one and the same Son, and only begotten, the divine Logos, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
even as the prophets from old have spoken concerning him, as the Lord Jesus Christ himself has taught us, and as the symbols of the fathers, the Nicene Creed, has delivered to us. The breakthrough of Chalcedon was made possible, at least partially, by the contribution of St. Leo the Great, a Pope of Rome, who in his tome drew a balanced and harmonious picture of the incarnate Christ as existing in two natures, united in one person. The bishops assembled at Chalcedon carefully compared the tome of St. Leo with the writings of St. Cyril and declared St. Leo's theology to be fully orthodox. The same article explains the aftermath of Chalcedon as follows. Because the regions where the Monophysites were in the majority were at the fringes of the empire, Egypt, Palestine, and Syria, and because the emperor tried to impose acceptance of Chalcedon by brute force, some historians explain the division between the Chalcedonians and non-Chalcedonians as being the result of political and cultural tensions. This is overly simplistic, as we realize when we note that the Christians in Syria were divided between Nestorians, Chalcedonians, and Monophysites. It might seem more plausible, at least on the surface, to say that the difference between Chalcedonians and Monophysites is only a matter of language, keeping in mind also that some of the Monophysites were Syriac speechers, speakers, which led to the problem of finding adequate translations of subtle theological terms. Nicholas Marinides, in his article Chalcedonian Orthodoxy and Non-Chalcedonian Heterodoxy, Heterodoxy, says that, If this is true, then why does St. John of Damascus, who knew their language, write against them? It is not true. Our Christology is different. Furthermore, the Orthodox have the miracle performed by the great martyr Ephemia at the Fourth Ecumenical Council to clarify the issue. In her coffin, she held the Orthodox Confession of Faith in her hand, and the non-Chalcedonian Confession was at her feet, trampling it. Are we going to say that God made a mistake with the miracle he performed through the great martyr Ephemia at the Fourth Ecumenical Council? Furthermore, Reunion attempts, and there were several, were all failures. Between the 4th and 6th ecumenical councils, 451 and 680 AD, there were many attempts at reunion between the Monophysites and Chalcedonians. Some were regional, others the official policy of the empire. In some cases, the attempts were made to blur the issues and come up with a statement vague enough that everyone could accept it and interpret it as they liked. In other cases, the emperor of the Patriarch of Constantinople simply forbade discussion of the points of division. None of these attempts, attempted reunions lasted. In the present attempt at reunion with the Monophysites, we see the same tendencies to blur the issues and to avoid mentioning points on which we disagree. The idea that we somehow hold the same faith, although one group accepts all of the ecumenical councils, while the other group rejects every council after the third, was stated in several discussions during this 1970 consultation. And here are some examples. The Coptic Bishop Gregorius says, We are asked why, if we accept the faith of Chalcedon, we do not accept the council itself. The fact is, that we have difficulties about the Horos, the definition of Chalcedon. Our fathers found Nestorianism in the Horos of Chalcedon. Even if we accept the teaching of Chalcedon, we are not obliged to accept Chalcedon. Another Ethiopian non-Chalcedonian says, By all means, you continue to believe in Chalcedon, but do not accept us to accept Chalcedon. And the Syrian Bishop Zaka, another now in Chalcedonian, says, When we say we accept the faith, we mean that the faith that the church had before Chalcedon, formulated by the three ecumenical councils accepted by all. Let us be quite clear. Chalcedon is not acceptable to us. And from another non-Chalcedonian, Verghese, 
He says, when the faith is already there without Chalcedon, why insist on Chalcedon being accepted? There should be no misunderstanding of the position of the non-Chalcedonian churches. There will be no formal acceptance of Chalcedon. The vehement assertion by these non-Chalcedonians, theologians, that Chalcedon is not acceptable to us, forces us to face the conclusion that if they do not accept the faith of Chalcedon, which was expressed in the definition of Chalcedon, then they do not accept the faith. The non-Chalcedonians do not share orthodox belief, and this is why they reject the 4th, 5th, and 6th orthodox councils. Still, one might argue that they are only resisting a certain language which seems to them to have Nestorian overtones. The question remains, do we have the same belief about the incarnation of Christ, simply expressing it in different words? Now, to see if this is so, let us look further at the paper presented by the, Mono the Monophysite, Father Verghese. And this is what he says in it. He says that the Sixth Council appears to us badly muddled, not to say in grievous error. He says, here, as earlier in the decree, the Tome of Leo is expressly affirmed. The decree actually calls the Tome the pillar of the right faith. You can perhaps understand that all this is rather difficult for us to accept. For us, Leo is still a heretic. It may be possible for us to refrain from condemning him by name in the interest of restoring communion between us, but we cannot, in good conscience, accept the Tome of Leo as the pillar of the right faith, or accept a council which made such a declaration. The council approves explicitly what I clearly regard as heresy in the Tome of Leo. Each form, and this is what the Tome of Leo says, each form does in communion with the other what pertains properly to it. The word, namely doing that which pertains to the word, and the flesh, that which pertains to the flesh. And the Monophysite cannot handle this. He says, if one rightly understands the hypostatic union, it is not possible to say that the flesh does something on its own, even if it is said to be in union with the word. The flesh does not have its own hypostasis. It is the hypostasis of the word which acts through the flesh. It is the same hypostasis of the word which does the actions of the word and of his own flesh. The argument of the Horos dogmatic definition in the Sixth Council is basically unacceptable to us. Vergis, the Monophysite, goes on and he says, We are unable to say that this council says when it affirms two wills and two operations conquering most fitly in him. To summarize, acceptance of the Sixth Council is much more difficult for us than the acceptance of Chalcedon. The following are the chief reasons. He says, We are unable to accept the, dith the dithelite formula attributing will and energy to the natures rather than to the hypostasis. We can only affirm the one united and unconfused divine human nature, will and energy of Christ, the incarnate word. And the other point he makes is, we find that the Sixth Council exalts as its standard mainly the teaching of Leo and Agatho, popes of Rome, paying only lip service to the teachings of the Blessed Cyril. We regard Leo as a heretic, for his teaching that the will and operation of Christ is to be attributed to the two natures of Christ rather than to one hypostasis. The human nature is as natural to Christ, the incarnate word, as is the divine. It is one hypostasis who now is both divine and human, and all the activities come from the one hypostasis. This is all heretical, and this is why these ideas, this is why the non-Chalcedonians were condemned by the Fourth Ecumenical Council, and they continue to be condemned. Because for the non-Chalcedonians, the humanity of Christ is purely passive instrument of his divinity, completely lacking in freedom and having no operation energy of its own. In this case, 
Christ's humanity is not, in fact, a freely and fully functioning humanity. Although it is still possible for the non chalcedonians to say that Christ is consubstantial to us with regard to his humanity, they clearly do not share the same beliefs as us with regard to Christ as perfect God and perfect man. The Sixth Ecumenical Council, however, is far more than the dogmatization of two wills in Christ. As Dr. Joseph Farrell points out in his excellent study, Free Choice in St. Maximus the Confessor. The theology of St. Maximus is exceptionally broad, deep, and subtle. I will briefly mention, and this is still according to the article, Chalcedonians and Monophysites, Do We Share the Same Beliefs? And in the article he says, I will briefly mention some of his conclusions regarding the importance of St. Maximus and the acceptance of his theology by the Orthodox Church in the Sixth Ecumenical Council. As he says, the Sixth Ecumenical Council is the confession, not so much of two wills in Christ, but of his human will, and therefore of the voluntary nature of his passion. It is also the confession of hu human free choice, and of the necessity of the cooperation of the human will in our salvation. Dr. Farrell also presents St. Maximus, and therefore the Sixth Ecumenical Council, as a major link in the chain of Orthodox theological development from the Arian controversy in the 4th century to the theology of St. Gregory Palamas and Hezekiah's Council of 1351. He writes, The Sixth Ecumenical Council is thus far more important for the Orthodox than is the Chalcedonian definition, because in its definition are hidden the responses of one of the Eastern Church's most brilliant theologians to the vital issues of divine predestination and human free will. Furthermore, it is important because in it is also hidden the presupposition of a vast theological development, reaching back beyond the triadology, Trinitarian theology, of the Cappadocians, to the Arian controversy, to the originist problematic, and its underlying Neoplatonic foundations. More than any other council, it was called upon to reflect in a systematic way upon the relationships of triadology, Christology, and the divine and human wills. In a major way, it confronts the issue of revelation and reason, of theosity, of theodicy, the problem of evil in a world created by a loving and omnipotent God, and the possible use or rejection of the philosophical meanings of philosophical terms. Dr. Farrell goes on to contrast the monothelite understanding of the sinlessness of Christ as a mere passive determination of the human nature by the divine nature with the Dathlete doctrine of St. Maximus, which takes as its starting point not fallen humanity, but the deified humanity of Christ and the saints in the eschaton, and points out that St. Maximus has truly outlined a unique doctrine of free choice. In so doing, he was led to posit the existence of a real distinction between the category of the divine essence and the divine energies, and of the divine energies amongst themselves. By doing this, he quite clearly pointed out the direction of subsequent development of the formulation of doctrine to St. Gregory Palamas. The Sixth Council is inseparable from the Council of Chalcedon, which it clarifies and interprets. It is my contention, therefore, and this is again according to the article, Chalcedonians and Monophysites, do we share the same beliefs, that it is through their attitude towards the Sixth Council, as well as the Fifth and Seventh, that we can see whether or not a particular Christian communion truly accepts the teaching of Chalcedon. Vergis, the Monophysite, concludes his paper by stating that if acceptance of the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, and Seventh Councils is necessary for a reunion, there is little hope that this will be achieved in the near future because the non-Chalcedonians reject these councils. Furthermore, far from the delusion 
that claims we have been separate branches, somehow united all this time, the reality is that not only have the non-Chalcedonians rejected the Orthodox Ecumenical Councils, these same councils have each condemned the non-Chalcedonians as heretics. In his article, Chalcedonian Orthodoxy and Non-Chalcedonian Heterodoxy, Marinides gives us the theological record in brief. He says, When we turn to the Church's theological record on the positions of the non-Chalcedonians, we see an apparently insurmountable obstacle to union on the terms agreed by the dialogue. The Monophysites, also designated by patristic writers as Severans, Akafalo, etc., are condemned not only by the Fourth Ecumenical Council, but also by all the subsequent ecumenical councils as part of the refutation of the Monophysitism itself or later heresies that were perceived to have stemmed from it, such as monothelitism and iconoclasm. The more or less concise definitions of the councils were informed and supported by the detailed polemical writings of such luminaries as Maximus the Confessor and John of Damascus, already mentioned, as well as others who are less well-known outside specialist circles. These decisions were confirmed routinely by later councils and fathers, most authoritatively in the Synodicon of Orthodoxy, which is appointed to be read out on the Sunday of Orthodoxy, though in practice often only a brief excerpt is recited, which does not name any specific heresies. There were certainly later attempts at reproachment and dialogue with a view to reunion between the Orthodox and non-Chalcedonians, most notably the attempts at reunion with the Armenians by St. Photius in the 9th century, which succeeded in bringing a large part of the Armenian people back to Orthodoxy, and under Emperor Manuel Comenus in the 12th, but always on the basis of the conciliar and patristic tradition. Furthermore, at least two of the giants of Orthodox theology in the 20th century, Georges Florovsky and Dmitry Stanilai, after initial enthusiasm, voiced concerns about the direction the dialogue was taking. The Orthodox Holy Fathers tell us that non-Chalcedonian Christology is heretical. Non-Chalcedonian Christology, as represented preeminently by the Monophysite Severus, denies the full reality and concreteness of Christ's human nature. Father Georges Florovsky writes, The followers of Severus could not speak of Christ's humanity as a nature. It broke down into a system of traits. For the doctrine of the Logos, taking humanity was still not developed fully by monophysitism into the idea of interhypostasisness. The Monophysites usually spoke of the Logos' humanity as economia. It is not without foundation that the fathers of the Council of Chalcedon detected here a subtle taste of original Docetism. Certainly this is not the Docetism of the ancient Gnostics at all, nor is it Apollinarianism. However, the followers of Severus the human, for the followers of Severus the human in Christ, was not entirely human for it was not active, was not self-motivated. In this contemplation of the Monophysites, the human in Christ was like a passive object of divine influence. Divinization, or theosis, seems to be a unilateral act of divinity without sufficiently taking into account the synergism of human freedom, the assumption of which in no way supposes a, a second subject. In conclusion, the non-Chalcedonians, which includes Coptics and others, they are not Eastern Orthodox. This is a misleading term. It is not correct. They are non-Orthodox. They are heretics. They have been condemned by the Fourth Ecumenical Council and subsequent Ecumenical Councils. They have been condemned by our Holy Fathers. They have not been orthodox for over a millennia and a half and do not accept our counsels. The orthodox church is one. To protect the orthodox from heresy, 
the Holy Fathers forbid intercommunion between the Orthodox and non-Chalcedonians. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers of the Ecumenical Councils, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us.